and modernization and budget optimization. This event will seek to address questions on the issue of military reforms that should address nation building through the concept of military service experience to a larger segment of the young population, the nuances of economics and operational efficiency involved in these processes. For today's discussion, we have an eminent panel consisting of veterans, civil servants, and media. Admiral Arun Prakash, PVSM, AVSM, VRC, VSM, former chairman of the Chiefs of Staff Committee and former Chief of Naval Staff, Indian Navy, Lieutenant General Philip Campos, PVSM, AVSM and BAR, VSM, former Vice Chief of Army Staff and former General Officer Commanding in Chief, Western Command, Air Marshal B. Suresh, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, former Air Officer Commanding in Chief, Western Air Command and Southern Air Command, Captain R. Sivasailam, IAS, former Principal Secretary, Government of West Bengal, Ms. Huma Siddiqui, Senior Journalist, Financial Express, and our Chair, Air Marshal M. Mathiswaran, AVSM VM, former Deputy Chief of Integrated Defense Staff at HQ IDS, and President of the Peninsula Foundation. I thank you all for being here today and invite Air Marshal Mathiswaran, Founder and Chairman of the Peninsula Foundation, to kindly introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sakshi. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure. Good evening to everybody. And it's a uh, great honor to see uh, uh, so many of our senior veterans uh, uh, in this uh, gathering today. It's an extremely important topic. And we have, uh, as Sakshi mentioned, an excellent, uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, Admiral uh, Arun sir has been, uh, 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 on, apart from being the chief and uh, ringside view as the chairman, uh, Chief of Staff Committee, He's also been involved in two of the committees that addressed military reforms and uh, national security issues, both in Arun Singh Committee as well as in Naresh Chandra Committee. And uh, similarly, uh, uh, General Campos has been the commander of the Western Command as well as Vice Chief of the Army Staff. And he's also been involved in the uh, modernization process as a uh, director, deputy director general uh, in the army headquarters as well earlier. But similarly, Air Marshal Suresh, who's commanded the Western Air Command, has also been Air Officer personnel, and he has an intimate uh, you know, knowledge about, uh, and he's handled the issues of uh, manpower, human resources for the Indian Air Force as well. Uh, we have with us uh, Captain uh, Smith Island and uh, from the IAS, who's also a military veteran of the 1965 war, and he's been uh, intimately involved during the 71 war refugee handling issues. And, and, and of course, he's worked in, apart from being uh, the principal secretary of uh, West Bengal government, he's also been involved in home ministry, in the ministries of education and in the ministries of commerce. And therefore, he brings a rich experience to today's discussion with that. And then we have Huma Siddiqui, who will bring in the civil uh, perspectives, uh, being a journalist, there can't be a better person to bring in uh, uh, that perspective. And she's the senior uh, journalist with financial interests. Well, today's topic is, uh, as uh, mentioned, it's about related to the Agnipath Agnivir scheme that the government has introduced. The government in India has actually set in motion a major restructuring process for the Indian military. This is the first step. Uh, of course, whether it's been, uh, you know, uh, 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 whether it's a holistic scheme or whether it's uh, a single uh, scheme that's been pushed urgently is something that we will discuss. Uh, but the, there is no, uh, you know, denying the fact that military reforms are necessary. Military restructuring is necessary given the various, uh, you know, factors that have been uh, animating our process in, uh, as a country. But uh, what comes to the fore is that whether a rushed in program like this for a four year Agnivir scheme, what will be the impact on various aspects of, uh, you know, the uh, military uh, society as a whole, the military structure as a whole and the governance process of the country. There are four major areas in which we would actually address this part. And this is where, uh, you know, I will start with uh, the, uh, the distinguished panelists, each one to take five minutes on the initial comments, and thereafter we'll get into a conversational mode. 
And uh, I would also invite comments uh, and participation from the audience, particularly since there are uh, very many experienced and senior veterans in this uh, audience as well. So how does this scheme look at uh, uh, or uh, present uh, to the country? Uh, the, quite naturally, the government was taken aback by the response or the protests that you know, emanated immediately after the introduction of the scheme. And, and that actually emanates from a significant level of disappointment from, and the, you know, uh, effect, uh, the, uh, the expectation that has been affected for the youth. That is one part. And then the government stepped in with uh, a lot of corrective measures, incentives, and various schemes that are being announced. And, and whether they have, uh, you know, the uh, credibility, whether they have the strength to convince the youth population is another matter which we'll have to see. But, but there are four areas in which the government is uh, saying this is necessary. One, as the Prime Minister mentioned clearly, that this is a nation-building process as well, which means he implies that we need to have a structure where more number of young people will need to get a military exposure, which will add to the overall nation-building process. Right, and, and and better, more number of uh, you know segment of the population gets to know what the military is, what national security is, what defending the country is all about. That is one part. Second part is, of course, a younger age, you know, uh, profile for the military, particularly for the army, and therefore they are saying from an average age of 32, 36, bring it down to less than 30 or maybe around 27, 28 by over a period of 10 to 12 years, and therefore they're looking at inducting these 17 to 21 years old uh, and start this process. The first start is 46,000, which will go up to a lakh plus subsequently. Uh, the third part is finance. And obviously I think that had a critical role to play in this entire process. The government has been worried about, uh, you know, the increasing load on the military budget or the defense budget in the context of pension load. And therefore, when you start this kind of a restructuring, one of the objectives is to, over a period of time, reduce the pension load. And that, they believe, will release more funds for modernization and capability development. Whether these are credible or not, the panelists will uh, touch upon these issues. So before we move on to uh, all these uh, discussion points, then let me first invite the initial comments from the panelists. Let me start with uh, Admiral Arun Prakash. So you. In your recent article, you've actually touched on the larger issue. You, you've actually said this Agni Wave scheme is, while it is necessary or while it is a good step forward, I think a larger holistic public issues need, should have been addressed in the context of nation building as well as articulation of national security strategy and military strategy. Uh, I, uh, you can start with your comments, sir. Thank you. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be in such distinguished company this evening. Thank you for asking me. Am I clearly audible, Natsi? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Now, you, you started off by saying that reforms, um, national security reforms are necessary. I think that's putting it rather mildly. We are a 75-year-old republic now, and uh, we have utterly failed to uh, come out of the World War II paradigm that we still continue to be in, at least without meaning any offense. At least I think the Indian Army continues to remain in that paradigm in many ways, doctrinally and organizationally. So reform is overdue, is putting it mildly. It is extremely overdue, and we should have done something about it many years ago. Many attempts have, have, have been made, as you mentioned, the Arun Singh Committee, the <clears throat> Group of Ministers, Naresh Chandra, etc., but they've all been abortive. Um, the other issue is that we've learned from our own experience since 1947 till now we faced conflicts. Today, we are facing a, a twin threat on our borders. We also have the dubious privilege of witnessing a conventional conflict which is unfolding in front of our eyes. So all the lessons, all the discussions that we've been indulging in, whether modern wars will be short and swift or whether they'll be prolonged or gray, gray zone wars, hybrid wars, it's all unfolding in front of us and we should be rapidly learning these lessons and implementing them. But on the contrary, I think we've been sitting on our hands. As I said, there have been futile or, or you know, uh, uh, aborted attempts at reform. We tried it a few years ago, then we were very heartened to see in 2020 that the government constituted a chief of defense staff. 
created a department of military affairs, etc. was a very heartening portent. But after the unfortunate demise of our first CDS, uh, for the past six months, there has been total stasis. So which means that either the government is having second thoughts or they think that it is not important enough. Now, the absence of a CDS sends out a very um, clear message. CDS is a, is a vital member of the nuclear command authority chain. So if you can do without a CDS for six months, uh, what kind of a message are you sending out? So uh, overall, it's, it's not a good message. Um, coming to the Agni path, Agni Veer issue, um, one hesitates to jump into this uh, issue uh, because for the simple reason that it has been rolled out, it is announced by the Raksha Mantri, the chiefs have been put in the limelight and they obviously support it to the hill. Service headquarters are saying we've given it a great deal of thought. So for any of us out of uniform, to criticize it or, or comment upon uh, it seems a little out of form. And yet it is such an important issue that I think it is necessary for us, pe people like us who had, you know, past experience, 30, 40 years, whatever it is, to make some kind of um, constructive suggestions about this very radical uh, change which has been brought about. So I'll just make a few pre preliminary remarks and then of course, uh, we'll await the wisdom of everybody. Our nation building is, is a very vital issue. Let me first of all say that this Agni Pat, Agni Veer was something that was possibly long overdue. We should have done it many years ago. But the, 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 the purposes, the objectives for which it is launched now at this moment um, don't seem to be quite sound. Um, nation building is a very noble objective to aim for. But for that purpose, we have the National Credit Corps a huge organization. It is absolutely the perfect vehicle for training our youth, given military experience, nation building, patriotism, etc. We have the territorial army. You have full freedom to expand the territorial army to whatever strength you wish to. And those are the organizations where you could try out experimentation and, and trial, etc. And then learn from that. And then if they are successful, then we could have uh, transferred them to the regular army instead of jumping headlong into something so radical. Um, Age profile, I'm not sure. At least I can speak for the Navy that we have no problem about age profile. I don't know about the Army. But Navy, we need young people. We also need mature people. We need people with 25 to 30 years of service as supervisors, as as, as um, you know, senior sailors who will guide the junior sailors. So we have uh, the Navy's average age is around 26, 27. So I don't see uh, any need to fiddle with the Navy's age profile. Perhaps the Army and Air Force can speak for themselves. Um, the last point that everybody talks about is that our pension bill is very bloated. All right, true, it's bloated. We should have foreseen this. It's not a, it's not rocket science that if, if the um, the long if the longevity is increasing, people are now living longer. We've had seven pay commissions. We have dearness allowance re reviewed every six months. So pensions will go up. So do we can do some, much about it? There are other sources of funding, um, modernization, etc. We can put pension, uh, we, we can put DNS allowance on hold, we can put um, pay commission in appearance, we, there's plenty of wasteful expenditure in, in the government of India, we can do all that. But to link pensions with modernization is illogical and very myopic. The two are totally different. We have to modernize, it's a national security imperative. We have to um, update, we have to phase out obsolete equipment, we have to have war wastage reserves. And to say that our pension is bill is very high and therefore we can't do any of this is going to be a suicidal uh, attitude to take. And I, I think the, the bureaucracy has ill-served the government of India by suggesting that first we save, save on pensions and then we will modernize the armed forces. And Agni Patwar Agni Veer is one of the ways of reducing pensions. Uh, lastly, let me just mention that we haven't recruited anyone for two years. So anyone who was recruited in 2013 will only retire after 30, 35 years. He will continue to draw pension for another 25 to 30 years. After he dies, his wife will continue to draw pension. So your pension savings will not show up in less than 30 to 40 years. Anything that you do today. So with those preliminary remarks, I uh, give, give the mic back to you, Matsi. Uh, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. That's uh, uh, very comprehensive. Uh, and I come to uh, General uh, Philip Campos. Uh, Philip, the Admiral uh, uh, raised one important uh, uh, point. One is uh, uh, the uh, issue of, in, is this the right time to initiate such a structural 
given the kind of problems that we have. And I just want to flag on that score uh, a few data uh, with, the, you know, uh, the David Singer research on correlates of war from University of Michigan, uh, they've analyzed 200 years of interstate wars, and they do that periodically, they continue. It started in the 1960s. And uh, so wars uh, have been analyzed and how prone and what is the threat environment which dictates various issues is uh, given, is analyzed quite well and extensively in that you know, program. So over 200 years, I mean, and it was just 30 years with imperial and colonial powers uh, right till the early 20th century, and then we increased. Now we are 200 states. So if you now take all those states, 150 states have never fought a war. 49 states have fought one or two wars. 16 states have fought three or four wars. It's only France, Germany, UK, Italy, Russia, Greece, Egypt, Turkey, and USA who have fought more than 10 wars. In fact, USA is called a war mongering nation for the uh, kind of work that they do. India in 75 years since independence has fought five wars. And if you take other conflicts, you know, by various conflict dimensions, the number of conflicts that India has been engaged, both internal and terrorist related issues is more than 30. And we are seen as a country who's, you know, one of the, uh, countries who are threatened by war more often than any other country. In fact, so in some of the rankings, we are number three there. So in this context, particularly what's happened with China, as the Admiral pointed out, is this the right time for a restructuring like this? That is one point. And second point is, uh, why four years? Is that going to be meaningful? Of course, the government has rolled out the scheme, but is can this be treated as a pilot project and, and look at it as you pointed out in one of your presentations? Seven years would be an optimum, and you had the seven-year color service scheme earlier. Philip, yes. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Air Marshal, for inviting me for this uh, discussion today evening. And it uh, feels great to be part of such a distinguished panel. Uh, I agree with what Admiral Arun Prakash has just said. And to continue uh, with what he said, and uh, to specifically answer the question that you've asked about whether this is the right time. Frankly, I don't think this is the right time. We've, in the army too, we have always been talking of transformation. We have gone through two phases of transformation and restructuring in the last 10 years or so. And uh, at both times, I was uh, director general perspective planning, not in the same tenure, but uh, I was director, uh, director General of Perspective Planning at Army Headquarters twice. And uh, each time we were handling uh, some part of trying to transform the Indian Army. So the point I'm making is that transformation is something that the Army has always been looking at very, very seriously. And it's not something that, uh, you know, we have some sort of, uh, uh, a, sort of a natural inclination to object to transformation when it takes place. Uh, the point is that transformation was long overdue. And to that extent, uh, the fact that something has happened in terms of the Agnipath scheme is a new initiative, it's, it's welcome. But the point is, when you take up transformation, then uh, obviously the timing has to be right. And what in, in what context am I speaking? When you take up transformation uh, in, in circumstances that you expect some sort of churn in the system, some sort of uh, you know, disruption of the system, uh, of the existing system, then uh, obviously this is not the right time uh, to be uh, you know, doing this. That's uh, in, in the context of uh, whether there is any threat on our borders. And you just explained that India is one of those countries which have fought uh, five wars. But what is more important is that we are all aware that for the last two years, uh, there has been a lot of assertiveness by the Chinese um, uh, since April, May 2020. Uh, and we are all aware of uh, the Galwan incident, which took place in June uh, 2020. Uh, it was a, a, a very violent uh, incident between the Indian and Chinese troops, which resulted in a significant number of casualties. 
that threat has not gone away. The Chinese have not gone away. The uh, intrusions are, uh, they have not withdrawn from their intrusions. We continue to talk to them, but uh, it, nothing, I mean, uh, they have still not gone away. So when we've got the Chinese at our gates and uh, the Pakistanis are also sort of waiting to step in in concert with the Chinese if something more serious takes place, the point is, is this the right time? I don't think so. When you are trying to uh, come up with a scheme which is going to cause a churn in the system, it's not advisable to be doing such a thing when uh, we are in a sort of semi-warlike situation on our disputed borders. So this is uh, one thing, this is my, my view on the timing of it. The second question that you asked about whether four years is a good time, I don't think so. I don't think four years is uh, good enough because four years satisfies nobody. For the military, you require a young soldier who comes in well-trained. And I'm not talking only about the infantry. We've got all the other combat arms, combat support arms, where we have something called trade training. Half your training at the regimental center or school uh, is uh, related to your trade, whether you're going to be a driver, a gunner, a radio operator. And if the training that you're being provided in the scheme is only the basic soldierly training or what we call basic infantry training, and the other part is going to be missed out, then obviously you're going to have a, because why you are missing it out is when you have a four year tenure, you can't have people doing anything more than six months of training because then he's got to be going on leave, which will be another uh, six months to a year. And uh, there are so many other things. And before you know what, he'll be gone. So that is why you're having a very curtailed sort of six months. And because the, uh, the training is curtailed, the quality of the soldier is poor. So I feel because the training has to be increased to at least one year, and the fact that a person has to have uh, some more sense of security, the military has to feel that you've got a soldier who is more sort of uh, adept uh, at doing what he's supposed to do. And he should have, would have also absorbed what is very precious to the army, what we call regimentation, that the sort of motivation for the soldier to fight for his flag. All this is not possible in a, uh, in a four year period. And I would say seven year is more like it because five to seven years is what I have always felt is the type of uh, period, uh, you know, duration you must, you must spend before you imbibe that sort of uh, motivation and uh, regimentation, which makes you actually fight and place your uh, life on the line in battle. Thanks, uh, Philip. I, I think. Uh... Uh, Captain uh, Sir Salem wants to uh, come in. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, let me ask uh, a Marshal uh, Suresh. Uh, so you've handled uh, the uh, uh, HR uh, uh, from the Air Force perspective, and uh, the Agnivir were coming in. Uh, in four years, we've we've also seen the earlier. We actually had a scheme called uh, JIT scheme, where we wanted to reduce the training period and do that training in two stages. So we got the guys trained for six months, got them into the tarmac, and then uh, we found that it is completely unacceptable and we, we dropped that scheme completely, if I'm right. And uh, now, aren't we getting back to some kind of a similar experience being forced down? Will, from an Air Force perspective, and the Admiral has also pointed out, from Air Force perspective, both are tech, highly tech services. Uh, will this make you know, uh, a reasonable uh, impact or will it be detrimental to the overall process? The scheme is anyway been rolled out. So obviously, how, we, how, we, how can we actually manage this entire process? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me on the panel and uh, also to event partners. And uh, my pronouns to all the esteemed co-panelists and the very seniors who are actually now attending this uh, you know, uh, discussion. I, I feel a little bit intimidated, so to speak. Uh, but let me start with three caveats. So like Arun Prakash has already said, and you also said, the scheme has already been rolled out. And has also been announced that there's no going back on the scheme. So now what is left for us to discuss? Actually, it's too late to debate whether it's good or bad. 
that that uh, stage is past so all that is left for us to do is to look at it professionally and give some actionable points to the people in uniform to make the scheme a success we have to at the end of the day whatever comes down you have to make a success of what is pushed down whatever they have accepted now as i see it also very important the i know arun pakar has talked about it the scheme will affect the fundamental structure of the service now we don't know uh, not many know whether it's going to be really good or bad positive negative we really don't know so then what do we do we need to actually foresee what are the challenges that are going to come ahead and then probably advise or give some inputs on how to tackle them and this is one of the things which you asked about when you talked about training i also have a small appeal if i really take on the question that you given sir that is you know in some quarters there has been some adverse criticism on the leadership of the services i think it's a little unfair you know given the prevalent system whatever is the environment prevailing i'm very sure because they are the ones are responsible to fight and win they know war fighting is their primary responsibility so given that i'm very sure they've discussed it in detail and they have forcefully put across their points and our credo is once everything has been put across and you know the company policy has been enumerated then everybody works to make it a success and thereafter i think anyone who is in a decision making position will take the onus and the responsibility for success or failure whichever comes that way that's true uh, now coming to this very specific point sir of uh, training in the you know air force especially firstly i don't know if it's a very good idea to have uh you know a kind of a one size fits all policy it's only the person who wears the shoe knows where the pinch is so if you're talking about uh, the air force all three forces actually have varied requirements totally varied requirements no it's not uh, fair to also put the navy and the air force in the same basket it's not true when numbers do matter it is equally important to train adequately like in the polar set and retain the talent here we are talking about you know all dimensions of warfare on I mean, air land sea cyber space knowledge information and there's a lot of need for uh, linkages you know cross domain linkages as well as cross agency linkages so where are we going to train the people to fight future wars technology wise how do we do it is four years it adequate now i'll restrict myself to the air force since you asked me to four years is it adequate for the air force no under the current pattern of training we have something called the joint basic physical training jbpt at belgom it's a common platform for training all trades the trades are not separated that stage and it's for 24 weeks thereafter like general campos said it takes time to employ people on their trades so they are sent for trade phase training and it is actually the whole train pattern just the basic training and the trade phase training varies from anything between 72 to 88 weeks as it stands today now if you were to employ them on platforms aircraft you know avionics whatever you talk about systems that is an additional technical type training course that they have to undergo it is only then now if you if you look at all this it's a huge challenge for the leaders from the air force and the eop there to work out a training pattern to make them useful as far as operations are concerned so now what will be happen you rightly said sir we have experimented but firstly we had all through training then somebody brought in this just in time training jit where the basic training was reduced to 12 weeks and then people were sent for trade phase training in parts we had to rescind it after about 8 years of experiment we went back to integrated pattern of training because we found that we are not really using these people for what they were inducted especially the technical traits as all because air force is technical and non tech traits it is very fine to say that you know non tech traits are yeah, given some arms training talk tell them about saluting parade and this and that and only carry on but we are a technology oriented force hmm. so how do we so especially as far as war fighting is concerned it takes time to train them to even do first line work air force we have let's say aircraft your first line second line and then of course the full how do you use them 
That's a huge challenge. Six years goes, you minus the leave, everything. And what is left for him to us to train him? And what is the time period available? So it's a huge challenge. I'm sure they are giving a lot of time and thought to this. And they will work it out somehow or the other. But I feel like General Campos said, four years is too short a time. We can look at seven. I will look at as far as the Air Force is concerned, 10, because you are going to invest in training. training. And where is the payback? Where is the operational payback? That's true. Hmm. So like Admiral Arun Prakash said, we have no issue with age. Where is the issue with age as far as Air Force is concerned? Hmm. So to put everybody on the same platform, I think may be incorrect. So you should give uh, the liberty, the flexibility to the services to decide what exactly is the requirement. Do you think, uh, you know, like the uh, U.S. system has, they bring in, they cater for, particularly in a technology intensive environment. So therefore people would be required at different levels. And therefore they have that two years, four years, six years, and nine years uh, contract systems. But the age is from 18 years to 39 years. And do you think that could probably, you know, we probably need to be looking at something of a similar format? I agree with you 100%. Sir. Now, if you're looking at future warfare, if you need people to come in, you're talking about IT, you're talking about networking, you're talking about, uh, you know, cyber, you're talking about space. You need specialists, not fly-by-night operators. Hmm. So you need to pick up people at varying ages, with varying uh, uh, specializations, utilize them the way you want them and give them different uh, exit policies. So it has to be a you know, uh, recruitment, uh, this thing, uh, qualification should be across the board. I fully agree with you. And that's the only way that the Air Force, at least, I know I'm not qualified to speak on Navy and Army, but Air Force, that's the only way it is going to work. It'll work. Why not? We'll come to this point again. So let me go to uh, uh, Sir Asylum, sir. Uh, you've been uh, both uh, in the army as you've uh, participated in the 65 war, and then you've been in the uh, you know governance as an IAS officer. And uh, now uh, the government has reacted to the protest to assure the people that the Agnivirs will have preference in lateral absorption into the police, into the paramilitary forces, and even the industry, corporate world, et cetera, right? The lateral absorption is something, I mean, you must be absolutely familiar, and we've actually been uh, discussing, debating for more than half a century. Uh, given the way in which our uh, various departments work and the turf battles that go on, the police and the central police forces and state, and police itself is a state subject, uh, is there any credibility in, in this, announcement of the government and does it need to be changed or backed up by actually a constitutional or parliamentary act that guarantees this process? Go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, friends. Uh, I will be very, very uh, focused on the question raised by a uh, This is about the lateral absorption. I can talk uh, authoritatively on this uh, subject because I myself is a lateral absorption when I was released from the army. You see, unlike the Agni path, which has been rolled out with specific terms for four years, when I was uh, commissioned into the army, our terms were not fixed. It was as long as the emergency is extended. But government came out pretty fast. See, like all schemes, the intentions of the government are very good. Even in this scheme, Always, if you yes. look at mm. the blueprint, the intentions are pretty good. But implementation, yes, it is lackadaisical. In our case, there were a lot of reservations in the government departments, banks, PSUs, UPSC. Those who had the access to information were able to get absorbed. But today's context is a bit alarming. I was looking at the figures released by Director General Resettlement. The scenario is very appalling. In the case of uh, banks, there are vacancies 
at the Group C and Group D level reserved for ex servicemen. You will be shocked to hear that there are 18,000 posts unfilled, unfulfilled as far as the nationalized banks are concerned. If we look at the Central Armed Police Force, there are a few Group A, Group B posts, but Group C and Group D posts, again, 92,000 vacancies remain unfulfilled. In the case of PSUs, 68,000. And in the case of central government, more shocking, 1,50,000 posts remain unfulfilled. Intentions are good, implementation is poor. I don't want this to be repeated when we are implementing the Agnipath scheme. Because in addition to these vacancies, they have announced 10% additional vacancies in certain sectors. How are we going to implement it? What is the mechanism? It should not remain in paper, all these promises. If the youth is agitating in Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Maharashtra, Telangana, because these are the people who contribute maximum number of people to the armed forces. They have reason. I'm not justifying it, but they have reason to agitate. We cannot just give them the promises that vacancies will be reserved. As pointed out by Air Marshal Suresh, I think it requires a constitutional guarantee. Unless this is done, all these reservations will remain only in paper. This is how our systems work. I mean, having worked in the system, I can tell you, unless until you put the checks and balances, system will not work efficiently. That is one point to answer the question. I have some additional points on the entire scheme itself. Qualitatively, our recruitment process is upgraded as far as Agnipath is concerned. The way it is rolled out, the way the processes have been explained, qualitatively, it is upgraded recruitment process for the armed forces, number one. Number two, it has become very competitive. I have today's information in the case of IAF, as reported by a, a Twitter handle uh, information by the PRO, 2,1,000 people have already registered for Agni Veer Vayu. Till now, 2,10,000 people have already registered. Look at the popularity of the scheme. At the same time, it also is competitive. So the best material you are able to get, get them in. Then we talked about nation building. I have one point on that. All along, we have been talking about nation building for the last 75 years through the youth. Yes, we had rolled out many programs. We had the UTC, University Training Corps. We had the ACC, Auxiliary Cadet Corps. We, have, we had the NCC. But then it all remained only up to the training. But here what happens? Training as Agnivi, and thereafter, if they are demobilized, they can be rehabilitated so that the training is useful. But this did not happen in the case of emergency commissioned officers and short service commissioned officers. Today, I think there is a rethinking, reawakening. I think the scheme will come out very well if we are able to implement it the way we have our good intentions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh... Yes, Ray, you wanted to say something. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. To uh, make two quick points on uh, what Captain Shilsailam said. Hmm. Uh, firstly, uh, it was a little disappointing, and he's absolutely right when you talk about parallel placements. Both six CPC and AVAC talked about this. AVAC also talked about, like for the Air Force, for the ground duty, it was supposed to be 40% short service, 60% permanent commission. 
and for the flying branch it was 30 short service and 70 investing and we had to actually talk about parallel placements of the short service so did the 6 cpc mention now uh, the comments of the mha as far as 6 cpc are very very clear they have their objections there was an inter ministry almost nine departments actually discussed this issue and all raised their hands and said we cannot accept the mod the mod that this was sometime early last decade uh so uh, unless like you sir actually it was uh, marshal mathe said and talked about illegal provision that has to come and uh, see unless it is guaranteed it is not really going to work because mod does not have the clout to push it across the other departments the second aspect is regarding the number of applicants i beg to differ sir i was the op when we actually started this selection test for airmen online and an average number of applications that come and you can rest assured this will also go up with that number will be in excess of 3 lakhs earlier we used to have the written test we used to have about 90000 applications which was reduced because of the written test and uh, of course there were a lot of issues you know the some board results we depended on the merit based on some state boards and things like that all that is out now so selection test for amn is online there are about 450 to 500 centers across india anybody can apply and you will find because at the end of 10th or 12th if you see the pool from which we are calling people they will always look forward to this it doesn't matter whether it's 4 years 10 years 15 years 20 years and a pension because they are struggling for subsistence so people will come in trust me and i'll give you the number now you will have 400000 applications for the agnivi scheme that was already existing we had that many numbers for the normal scheme and it will come where is the doubt so uh, that is all my submissions admiral would you want to come in on this uh, as a chairman you would have actually fought a lot of battles on this uh, lateral induction and why it is not taken off or why it's never taken off yes i was surprised at how naive this assumption was that you know we'll make some reservations and people will get uh, absorbed automatically i mean in, in my service <laughs> we fought this battle many times as, as suresh pointed out the ajay vikram singh committee report was predicated on the fact that you will take short service commission officers and then hive them off and they will automatically jump into the central armed police forces and similarly for our ex servicemen there are reserved vacancies as mr uh, sivas salam pointed out but everybody but everybody every agency every ministry has steadfastly refused to absorb ex servicemen whether it's states or central whether and their logic is also uh, you know you have to accept it that what will happen to their own cadres central armed police forces have they got their own cadres their own promotion prospects so if you suddenly induct armed forces into it what happens to them we can't we can't answer that kind of logic so it has to be a legislation an act of parliament in the usa there is something known as a gi bill anybody who serves in the armed forces when he comes back after his engagement is assured by the by an act of congress of educational uh, facilities of employment facilities and the employers are um, are forced to they have they have national guards who who come every weekend and you know do their flying or service and go back their employers are uh, are mandated to spare them for that so the point is that i think we need it to be quite clear that is this a social engineering experiment if it is fine that we can find ways of handling that as as mr sevasalem pointed out there were ncc acc territorial army we can handle that is this meant to enhance uh, combat efficiency of the armed forces then of course we we can get around that also i mean scheme has been rolled out it should not be taken taken back but we can certainly make some major modifications and make it palatable acceptable for one i would say it should be a parallel we should resume our normal recruitment process and in addition have a small percentage of these agni pat agni veer entries then after a year or two we'll see how it pans out but it will not disturb the, the balance of the armed forces the hierarchical structure after all the armed forces are not made of only young men there are Uh, you know in the air force you have corporal sergeants mm-hmm. master warrant officers and so on uh, so with our majors where do they come from they all serve for 30 years 35 years they retire at 55 years so when you talk about reducing the average age 
what happens to our master warrant officers master chiefs subedar majors is have to be there so i think uh, modification is required keep the scheme but do some tinkering extend the service to 5 to 7 years um, have it as a parallel entry see how it pans out and then take a decision after what what's the panic where is the panic absolutely philip uh, would you want to come in because the army i think it impacts on the army significantly see and for many years i think uh, there's been a demand that uh, bsf and the central uh, armed police forces could become a conduit for absorbing the uh, you know army veterans because they're trained and they can be retrained and absorbed where has been the bottleneck and why has been the resistance see we have already discussed this enough i don't think the capf or uh, the bsf or whoever will ever take anybody because uh, i've seen so many of these short service officer schemes where we say that the uh, permanent cadre will be smaller and we will have a larger short service cadre and here we are talking of a 100% short service cadre and mm-hmm. then we are talking about trying to absorb the people who are released and as high as 75% uh, that they will be absorbed in uh, the the psus or Uh, or, or the central uh, police forces, or even the corporate, I think uh, it's not going to happen. And even with the corporate, I find it very suspicious, because when it actually comes down to corporates saying that they're going to absorb, what is their sense of absorbing? If it is going to be guards outside their uh, uh, outside their establishments and offices, well, uh, that's not worth. It. That's not what this whole uh, concept is about. Absolutely, but. Uh, i've got a couple of uh, issues uh, about the scheme not so much we have already spoken about the scheme uh, it would be much better if it was for a longer period if it it would be much better if there was a parallel scheme of permanent people because you need that lot of permanent mature uh, trained well trained people in the system mm. and this short service system should be a support a uh, sort of system it cannot be that the entire system is short service uh, it it will have its major problems but the point i'm making is that there is something which is happening here uh, in terms of what we are calling in the army uh, as the optimization scheme the reduction in numbers mm. uh, this has been talked about for many years and uh, various figures have been put on it now we are talking of a figure of about 2 lakhs because uh, as the minister of state for defense said in the parliament last december that there was a shortage shortfall of 98000 people in the army already on account of uh, no recruitment having taken place for two years so now we are a, well a into number. a third year we are well into a third year so we are talking of a very large number maybe 1 lakh 30000 or so who are already short and uh, by the time this uh, scheme rolls out and the scheme the number of people being inducted are not equal to the number of people retiring so at the end of it there is something called optimization or, or put simply reduction in numbers so we are talking of the enemy on the borders reduction in numbers and a churn in the system which uh, will you know which really doesn't go well with whatever is happening in terms of operational preparedness and you may also be aware that in the midst of all this for the army is something called tinkering with the system of one class regiments and one class regiments are not one or two mm. i think the almost every uh, regiment of the infantry is a one class regiment uh, there are very few like the paratroopers or, or in the mechanized infantry we have the guards Mm. Uh, a few more which may be uh, what you call not one class and all india all class that is the infantry and then in the armored corps you have many one class regiments in the mechanized infantry we've got uh, 14 battalions which are uh, one class same similarly in the guards so what i'm saying is that system is also being tinkered with that is a very disruptive thing we have gone through an exercise for many years in the army and finally we gave up and reverted to the one class system so in the churn where we are talking about quality then we are talking about a reduction in quality and then into this melting pot you also add the uh, uh, disruption of all india class i mean one class units and make them all india uh, class units at the same time i think this sort of the timing of it 
seems to have not been given adequate thought to. Thanks, Philip. Let me come to uh, Huma Siddiqui. Uh, Huma, uh, uh, how do you actually perceive uh, this scheme that's been rolled out by the government and the response from a civil, you know, uh, 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 civil uh, perspective? And uh, as a journalist, you obviously have the pulse of the uh, uh, the population who's affected by it. Now, what are they looking for? They're just looking for a job guarantee. Uh, they are animated by patriotism to join the military, and therefore, uh, you know, would they quickly transform and understand and move, accept the four-year process? Anyway, they don't have a choice. The government has rolled out. So, what would be the reaction? So the way. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Huma, and uh, uh, as a disclaimer, these are my personal thoughts, not representing my organization here. Uh, when on Sunday, when they announced on the 14th of June about this scheme, so the first thought that came to mind was, oh, okay, good, it's it's going to be good, and you know the youth will, young blood will join the armed forces. But as it started, you know, um, and uh, you know, uh, the moment they started talking about the pro, uh, what all they are going to offer, how they are going to save money on the pensions, how that money that that is going to be saved is going to be used for modernization. Then you started gradually understanding that this is not the way it has been announced. And I think the scheme, if implemented properly, will do a lot of good for the youth. Unfortunately, it's really been pushed. And there's really a lack of understanding, even amongst the youth, what, what are they going to do? Because wherever I'm talking, they all are saying, ma'am, this is just going to be for four years. What will, we, what will we do after four years? That means there is a lack of clarity that when they come out, are they just going to be guards? Like they keep showing the photos of, you know, going to a uh, as a guard job or as an ATM guard job uh, or as, you know, just as a driver, drive uh, heavy vehicles. So the, everyone is not excited. Unfortunately, the word that they, uh, they are using is, you know, nationalism, patriotism, more of country love. We all love the country. It's not as if only the youth will love the country and we are not loving. But the thing, it's not been sold properly. It should have been done in a very gradual manner. It should have been initiated from the school, from the NCC upwards. That's what I think. And suddenly you're saying, okay, 17 and a half to 23, you're going to get a job. And then what next? So now he's going to get a stamp that he's retired. That's the way I'm understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So now a 23 year old with a, you know, with a tag of being retired from the army, what are the chances that he'll get job elsewhere? Okay, so the government is saying we are making sure that there are reservation, reservations for jobs in various, you know, DPSUs, in other organizations, in the private sector. But really, are you sure that all these people who will come out, the 75% that will come out will get jobs outside? And like somebody said, even in the Department of Settlement, uh, Directorate of Settlement, I was I was also looking at those numbers. There are still so many vacancies there. So how come people are not getting those jobs? There is a problem somewhere. So when you talk about the youth, uh, I think there is still a lack of uh, you know clarity and they are going to apply for it. Yes, there are people who want that money. At the end of that day, if you're going to give me 11 and a half lakhs in hand, at whatever cost I'll get that money at the end of it. Some people will probably use it to go get married or get their family, I mean, get a house, uh, get a, you know, get a house constructed or get their sisters married. What next once that money is over? So I, I, I don't know, there are a lot of problems and maybe during the course of a discussion here, some of my questions will be answered talking about that money being used for modernization, that is also a little bit odd. I mean, how much money are you going to save from the pension fund that can be used for the modernization of the armed forces? So I'm also looking for <laughs> some kind of a clarity on that. So maybe I'll share, I'll come back again and talk okay. about Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Huma. And uh, there are uh, hands coming up. We will, uh, we will just get to you. Let me go around one more. Yeah, Suresh, you want to say something? 
very quick point sir uh, like uh, one is about what general compost talked about you know we have two issues we are calling them not uh, veter- uh, no, uh, soldiers sailors or airmen we are calling them activists so it's a separate class and then you have only 25% being absorbed my main worry is and the worry should be for the people in power and the services uh, it should not lead to uh, cohesion in a war fighting unit is most important that should never be disturbed you know so if you're talking about selection criteria and things like that for this 25% you need to be very careful about the whole thing uh, i think we have put too many things we are trying to resolve too many things with this one scheme Uh, actually, I'm getting lost a little bit because I think our primary focus should be on war fighting and what will be the effect of everything as far as war fighting is concerned. How do we make our armed forces future battle ready? That should be the primary focus. Rest everything is collateral benefits which you're talking about. Hmm. That is the way we need to look at it. Na- no, nation building is, uh, that is not our primary responsibility. There are so many other schemes. You have NSS, you know, Ministry of Youth and uh, no, Sports and uh, Youth Welfare. Uh, so many other schemes are there. NCC, Territorial Army. There are so many other schemes. Why don't you actually empower them? Why don't you energize them? We should not lose our uh, no, no, North you know, uh, Compass, War Fighting Compass. We should not drift from the North, poor North. You can take on everything. Hmm. But this is not your primary job. The primary job is war fighting to fight and win. In war, there are only two positions, the victor and the vanquished. You need to decide where you need to be in future wars. So if that be the case, then I need to concentrate on that. The rest are all additional benefits purely. Now, as far as... Uh, so this is what I need to actually put in. Otherwise, yeah. it tends to be a little muddled. Uh, Uh, Admiral, do you wanted to say something? That's- yes, I, I think we've, uh, you know, it is not in our place to discuss the re-employment prospects of demobilized soldiers, sailors and airmen. You know, that's not the con- that should not be the concern, main concern of the armed forces. And as the yeah, Marshal just pointed out, mm-hmm. war fighting, combat efficiency should be our primary uh, d- issues of discussion, even here when people are out of uniform. So, as uh, the General Kapoor said, we've already downsized or right-sized the army, uh, downsized the army by a lakh plus. And by the time we end up, it may be two lakhs. Now, for all we know, this may be a step in the right direction that we have right-sized our army. Good. Well done. But it should have been part of a larger re- reform, uh, well-thought-out reform, not Can just tinkering. Know? I mean, we should have started from the top. Uh, here we are playing with little pieces, jigsaw puzzle. And starting from the bottom by fiddling around with recruitment system, we should start from the top, higher defense organization, um, mm. the structure, the army is certainly, perhaps uh, it, it can be a little leaner than what it is today from 1.4 million, we can bring it down. We are still talking about core, core size formation. Nobody else in the world talks about core size formation. The, the war in Ukraine is being fought by battle, uh, battalion tactical groups. Have we thought of those? So, start thinking from higher defense organization, work down how you want to fight a war. And at the end of it, perhaps Agni Pat or Agni Veer may be one of the logical steps that you should have taken. But here, instead of thinking on those, you know, at a, at, at a macro level, you've started at a micro level. So I, I would suggest that we should also direct this discussion towards uh, the macro, macro level reform that is highly, highly overdue. Thank Absolutely. you. Okay. Yeah, Philip, go ahead, please. See, one of the points I have See, uh, one of the uh, topics we are covering here is related to modernization, modernization of the force. Over the last many years, uh, where modernization has been lagging is the lack of funds. We are all aware of it as to how the percentage which goes in for revenue has kept increasing. And to that extent, uh, how the uh, funds available for capital modernization has been shrinking. And now we are Uh, down to very abysmal levels of uh, funding that is available for capital modernization. Now, when we uh, talk about uh, this as a uh, uh, the financial aspect of pension saving, salary saving scheme, are we sure that this money is going to get recycled into modernization? Because for many years, the military has been trying for just that. They have been saying that once funds are allocated for modern for the military 
they should not be surrendered they should uh, there should be some way that these there should be a non lapsable fund for defense Pooling. modernization now we don't hear anything of a non lapsable fund unless you have a non lapsable fund or some concept of a fund somewhere where all this money which you are supposed to be saving of 75% of the people not being uh, paid their pensions how sure are we that this money is going to be channelized towards capital modernization or whether there is a, even an intent to do that uh, you know we are not even talking of a linkage between pension and agnipat scheme we we uh, so how sure are we that what is this being done for is the money saved going to make us more modern get us better equipment i, I would also like to talk in the context of uh, you know the military and manpower uh, i was an army commander at the time that uh, you know we were talking about raising accretions for the northern border for the chinese border and i remember being asked time and again that the does the army have to have so much more manpower and my response used to be no we don't want so much of manpower we want better equipment we want more modern equipment mm. much more of it but if you if we do not have that equipment for various reasons our uh, processes the funds uh, lack of funds etc etc when we are not getting the equipment then what does the military do does the military raise its hands and say uh, we are not going to fight or we are not good enough no the in cases where you do not have quality then quantity has a quality of its own and that is what the military has been at least the army has been falling back on that we we uh, we want manpower because we find that uh, we have we are not getting the technology that we are being talking about as alternatives or improvements in the system if we are not getting it then sorry we have to continue with manpower and so you can't have sudden optimization schemes uh, being thrust down without being sure how this optimization is going to actually going to take place on the ground so philip that's a paradox because uh, uh, one of the arguments given is the it is also to push the military particularly the army to become move towards more uh, technology you know absorption and uh, reduce the numbers become more tech savvy but you are inducting people at 17 and a half and that that goes against that entire objective of you know inducting people with better qualification better technological better qualification technology absorption and being tech savvy so i think there is a conflict there uh, in mm-hmm. that context but modernization issue i think we have been reforming our acquisition processes but our modernization is still painfully slow so more than the fund availability i think our procedural processes are are uh, there to be blamed that is one part second is saving money out of this scheme it will take 20 years before you actually become substantially pensions that would be saved as admiral pointed out probably it will be 30 to 40 years before you actually think that this is going to make a major difference so i think the argument that this would contribute to accelerate the modernization process i don't think it stands on a solid ground at all anyway yeah uh, suresh you want to say something here sir you more than anyone else are fully aware you know you are the research pp and fd and you are looking after the acquisitions what uh, general campos talked about you know we talked what are we talking about funds for modernization whatever is the budgetary allocation and even the revised estimates are not being spent so last year if you talk about the army they used about 40% maybe 90% or whatever i have also said that. and maybe 70 80% so every year on year you are not even able to spend your allocations so what are we now trying to talk about pensions being now if you you know save on pensions and pay you will allocate it for modernization and especially like when you mentioned you cannot roll over this is one of the requests we made and that must be implemented if you really if you're looking at modernization you need to actually accumulate because you rightly said as the processes everybody is aware Absolutely. it's not that the armed forces don't want to modernize absolutely there is a huge backlog i mean that's right. i rest my case there uh, let me invite the audience uh, raise your hands and you can also p- uh, put it in the chat box for any questions 
Mr. Garg has raised his hand. Uh, please go ahead, unmute yourself, and you can ask the question. And, and I have an issue uh, to discuss on the national nation building process. Well, bring I'll come to that conversation a little later. Mr. Garg. Okay. Uh, he doesn't seem to be hearing us. Okay. Let me come to the point about uh, uh, the nation building process. And this is where uh, both Admiral and probably uh, 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 Captain Sir Asylum can comment on this process. Uh, the nation building process, uh, if we now look at, uh, if I uh, uh, see the aspect of compulsory military service, it's a process through conscription and, and a development process in most developed countries uh, has been there for long. And then they've moved in, like the US moved into a volunteer military system in the 1970s. They dropped the draft and, and the conscription part. The Israelis have a compulsory military service scheme, uh, but that itself is undergoing a lot of changes. There are many other countries that have, but many of these countries that have shifted or become democracies and uh, become volunteer militaries are resting on the strength of a military service that's contributed immensely to nation building and cohesiveness and national spirit. Nobody can deny that part. We seem to have missed that part immediately after 1947. And we should have had, like the Admiral pointed out, we had many other schemes. We had an auxiliary air force, we wound it up in the 60s. We have a territorial army, which is a very fine institution, but we are not uh, you know, uh, giving adequate importance to it. We don't have an effective active service system. I think uh, Philip can comment on that uh, subsequently. So uh, the uh, along with looking at, as the Admiral pointed out, looking at the micro level restructuring, a macro level it, uh, look has, should have been taken in bringing in the youngsters into a larger exposure through creation of a system like National Guards that the US has, which is, uh, which is a combination of territorial army and the auxiliary air force system, bring in more avenues for Coast Guard format, or a combined uh, process like the Israeli military has, where after 12, you get an exposure, which is reformat or restructure the NCC system to bring in that kind of a process. With that process, it has to be also linked to incentives. Why would anybody come and do that? If you do that, here is uh, privileges that you get. Or if you say, if the political system needs to be reformed, every person who wants to stand for elections, whether from councillor or to the member of parliament, should have at a young age gone through this process, that two years or three years of service. If we bring in that kind of a rationalizing process, then I think a nation building process will get addressed better rather than expect this micro level restructuring of restructuring of the army alone to contribute to that part. Uh, comments on uh, this issue. Admiral? Yes, uh, thank you, Matsu. Now, this um, analogy with Israel, Singapore, and so on, I think it's being uh, misused. These are tiny countries with small populations. Uh, they have a major national security issue there, lack of male volunteers for uh, serving in the armed forces. Therefore, they had no choice but to resort to conscription, open up the doors of the armed forces, even to women. Uh, even USA had this problem during the Vietnam War. They were not getting enough volunteers. The UK had conscription. So these countries have adopted conscription because they need manpower for their armed forces. Here, as people have just been pointing out, for every single vacancy in the armed forces, you'll have hundreds of thousands of volunteers. There are 4 lakh people uh, volunteering for Air Force, for, you know, 10, 15, 1,000 jobs. So that analogy is flawed. Yes, by having cons conscription, you do... You are not people, young people who are disciplined and learn you know, uh, all about uh, national service and so on. But then you must have a system in Singapore. They have a revolving door system. They put, they put people through the armed forces. At some stage, they pluck them out, send them to for higher education, business school, etc. Bring them back, put them into politics. And eventually, they become prime ministers of Singapore. They're all, every single prime minister has had national service. That's what we want. That's so... Right. Conscription is not what we need. We need to discipline our youth, teach them about patriotism, nationalism. There are various ways of doing it, uh, but you don't have to burden the armed forces with this kind of a task. 
territorial army is a very good uh, but to my dismay i read somewhere recently that uh, the, the railways have just disbanded their territorial uh, uh, battalions the the railways territorial battalions were proving uh, you know providing sterling service every time there was a strike it was a ta battalion the same chap Uh, railway workers would be put into uniform and made to drive trains and, and do the so there are ta ecological battalions which are doing sterling service so let us focus on the right uh, on the right issues let's not burden the armed forces with social engineering projects yes if it is contributing to the armed forces efficiency combat effectiveness by all means but if we want patriotism etc etc then find some other avenues some other ministry to do captain sivasaidam sir anything yes i also feel the same way uh, conscription as a terminology has already been thrown into the archives i don't think uh, that is uh, feasible as far as our country is concerned but then bringing in uh, no, military like just clarify there one conscription is not the one that we are uh, saying that is the model that the uh, those countries have followed is what i yeah, said yeah yeah small what we need to do is we need to actually make it attractive for more people to come in and do some of these services and they need to get privileged or preferences given to them to retain that attractiveness for young people to come in That's no i i started with the conscription just to explain this point yes the idea is pretty good but is a bit difficult to implement uh, reason being budgetary constraint as such they talk about budget optimization as far as the defense forces are concerned um, and as uh, admiral has rightly pointed out we can't burden the armed forces with uh, military training for the citizens and then you also mentioned about uh, uh, making uh, this as a precondition for entering into politics or uh, service or posts uh, which are required by the government i don't think we can have that type of reservation because as such we are saddled with uh, too many reservations but my idea as far as uh, military training is concerned yes it is essential how do we introduce it uh, we can uh, as uh, an experimental measure uh, put all the uh, university graduates post graduates on a voluntary basis to go through a two years uh, military attachment which will teach them the basic uh, tenets of uh, military discipline and come back to the society but that has to be incentivized it is possible i don't think uh, uh, we are looking at it that way uh, but then now that uh, the agnipath scheme has come we have started telling that this will be used as a nation building exercise i don't think agnipath agnivir is meant for the armed forces uh, tra- uh, recruitment training and utilization uh, this can't be used towards uh, uh, nation building of course it is used towards the national security uh, but as a selective measure yes compulsory Uh, not compulsory i would say voluntary military training can be introduced to university graduates uh, subject to budgetary constraints yes yeah yes suresh yeah air marshal suresh sir uh, with your permission you know like Please. once again i'll repeat actually the primary driver for any military reform should be enhancement of war fighting capability having said that now what are the challenges in our society we cannot compare like a pagar said a country with usa singapore israel sweden whatever we have a large and diverse population huge rural urban divide there is a very low percentage of people high uh, attending secondary schools if you look at the uh, no smile foundation report and others it will come out very clearly so the pre primary to class 12 there is more than 1.5 million schools available today but there are only 264 million students out of a possible 40% of the population is below the age of 18 but this is actually the reality so i like to be a little practical about the whole thing and many drop out at the 8th grade level this is the system education system and boards are not even standardized now most of the people like we discussed earlier in the day sir work in the unorganized sector. subsistence is still an issue with a majority of the population and there is no social security so most people look forward for upward mobility with stability that is the reality of our country today 
Now, but we need a different model, I agree with you, for India. So how do we go about it? Like everybody has talked about it. It is not the mandate of the armed forces to bring in social engineering. Like I think that's what I'm saying. Now, there are so many schemes which are already in place. It's a huge challenge. There are no easy solutions. Trust me. Sir. Now, look at NCC as a feeder for other ranks of the armed forces. You can do that. Also look at CAPFs, NDRFs, etc. The combined strength, if you look at it, is 2 million plus. 2 million plus. If you look at it. I maintain, like you said, sir, have multiple entry schemes with a larger age bracket depending on specialization. Maintain active reserve and national guard. That is another thing. Why not look at air policing? It is totally absent in this country. And build capacities for regular training of reserves. Once again, they get being Prakash said. But here, are you willing to invest because the real costs are involved? There in Israel, every week, a F-16 pilot goes back to his partner at the cost of the company for flying his mandatory hours. But that is not the case here. Can you afford it? We have the hours available for, to train the people in the reserves. So a lot of costs are involved, a lot of other issues are involved. We need to revamp the TA scheme like Captain Suicide would say. Hello, hello. There is also the NSS scheme, like I said earlier. There are so many other schemes that can be actually put into use for nation building, but that needs to come under one umbrella. The armed forces need to be needs to be a participant and facilitator, but not the driver for this. This is my take on the subject. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Philip, go ahead. Yeah, please. See, there is uh, when we are talking of nation building, we let's also talk about national integration and how this scheme could end up uh, adversely affecting national integration. Because when we talk of a all India level scheme or all India merit based scheme, uh, online exams to select who comes into the military and whom doesn't, what will happen is uh, we there are some states where who will specialize in you know maxing these exams depending on how they go about it. And uh, there will be many other states who will get left out. So the system of having some sort of recruitable, you know, male population being worked out state-wise and making sure that some sort of distribution, though it was not an exact distribution that you had to provide. If some state didn't take it, somebody else took it. But if you're going to have a process where uh, it appears that some states will just lose out on the vacancies which are coming, uh, then again, instead of uh, nation building uh, in, in terms of national integration, we would be losing out somewhere. Because this is something which again, has been sort of glossed over and I, I think it requires more attention. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, we have, uh, there are a few comments and uh, what uh, turns out to be a question, I'll just uh, call out uh, Brigadier Deepak Sinha. Uh, Deepak, would you want to call out uh, or do you want me to read it out? But, okay, I'll read out here. By implementing a centralized merit scheme for inducting RDVs, it will damage national integration that was ensured till now with induction based on RMP factor, etc. Now, induction will be skewed towards states and communities that have better literacy rates and education infrastructure. What about hill and border states? Probably you can comment on this. Little Philip, you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. See, that's exactly what I was saying. That you know, we have spent a lot of time over the years in ensuring that our military, uh, you know, being a very important uh, institution is reflective of uh, the entire country and not just a few states. So we've got this uh, process, which have, have, we've had this process of uh, allotting, allotting vacancies as per the recruitable male population. But somewhere, I think this is not being mentioned here. And uh, by the time you realize it, it's again, the first people who will get hit are those from the Northeastern states. 
<clears throat> who normally uh, you know cannot compete because of the facilities available uh, and the inclinations of the people so somewhere i think uh, this is going to detract from uh, national integration and to that extent uh, it has its adverse effects on nation building okay there is another comment on uh, uh, cost saving by ram shankar saravanan uh, cost saving is not a good deal towards soldiers who are all trained to protect the nation in the borders by facing lots of difficulties okay that's just a comment it's not a question okay uh, Yeah, can i just uh, come in uh, for 30 seconds on the yeah, rmp please. yeah please uh, you know actually rmp went out of the window some time back hmm. uh, as far i don't know about the army but as far as the air force is concerned uh, especially now because early under the earlier system of induction i told uh, you know i said earlier we had written exams around 50 52% of the induction into the air force was concentrated from five states i don't want to name them because i is no point naming it but that was the case and to <coughs> ensure some amount of rmp you know, recruitable male population special drives were undertaken from unrepresented states so that was the policy being followed and also for musicians and in the medical assistance and etc but in spite of all that and even when we transition from that to the star you will find that sir general campos you mentioned you know there are people being trained you know to crack these exams you are free to actually ask for three centers from which you can appear even on the star you will find that ultimately you will end up with this because a lot of states don't find the armed forces fairly attractive as far as the other ranks and this will continue to prevail i really don't have an answer as to how to get across the system for national integration but something seriously needs to be thought about to adjust this imbalance in the composition of the armed forces i'm not talking about the army sir i can at least uh, say with authority about the air force that's it thank you uh, ya marshal suresh uh there is one uh, uh, issue that you raised which is also equally important and uh, which is uh, with respect to the uh, as we move along with the agnivi scheme it's we i would say this is the first step and then they would make in corrections they would uh, expand this and as we move along uh given the social uh, uh, you know uh, the society that we have and given the environment that we have and the need for the army to actually Uh, are the armed forces to bring in more and more people who are capable of dealing with technology and the future of warfare while everybody is until now has been talking about the requirement is to fight a swift war and a short war i think the ukraine probably would demolish that process <coughs> and probably be prepared to in if there is a war you be prepared to actually be uh, entangled for a very long time given all these you know constructs uh how do we address our recruitment uh you know uh, uh, recruitment of sailors uh, soldiers and air warriors uh with uh, uh, with a provision or with a uh, perception where they could do be an enlisted person they could serve for a certain amount of time go back and still be you know ready to enter the uh, civil services enter the corporate world get educated uh, is that transformation possible uh, let me uh, ask uh, captain sivasailam i mean being on both sides is that possible in india at some point of time i'll give an example for this uh, organsky who brought about the theory of power transition theory in international relations was an enlisted us marine he came out and then he entered the university educated himself and now he would proudly claim that i was an enlisted marine but i have the admirals and the generals learning from me the uh, principles of uh, you know uh, international relations is one example uh, john boyd who created the wooda loop theory he fought as a enlisted uh, gi in the second world war came out educated himself 
then joined the US Air Force and he became a fighter pilot and, and he became a you know, strategist par excellence. So is there any scope for changing the mindsets of our social environment in the Indian context or will it change? Captain Sir Silence. Very, very difficult uh, environment we have. I think in our society, the way we are structured, the way we behave as uh, social animals, there is a lot of uh, divisions, subdivisions, sub subdivisions, regimentation. To, to bring in the Army, Air Force, Navy expertise into the civil stream is totally unacceptable to the civil society. How does the civil society perform or function? They don't want uh, your Army Act, Air Force Act, or Navy regulations. They just don't want. Forget about the citizen. The civil service, they don't want your Army Act, your Navy Act, and your uh, Air Force uh, regulations because they are too rigid. It puts you into a capsule. They don't want to work in a capsule. The examples you gave are brilliant examples, but I think they are exceptions. In our country itself, yes, there are. In fact, I had a chief secretary in Tamil Nadu who was a Second World War veteran. Today, he's running age 100. <coughs> Last week, we celebrated his birthday. 100th birthday, Second World War veteran, brought in a lot of expertise to the civil service when he joined the civil service, but that is an exception. People do not want uh, a regimented life. The moment an army, navy, air force veteran gets into the civil stream, he wants to bring everything into order. <laughs> I was very unpopular in my system because of my attitude. I tried to implement the checks and balances. I became unpopular. I mean, this is the fact of life which we must understand and uh, take it uh, with a pinch of salt. This is what it happens. In the Indian society and polity, I think it's very, very difficult. I would say impossible. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, any comments on that? Uh, well, yes, but in the Navy, we've had a number of flag officers who've risen from the ranks of sailors by their sheer uh, hard work and, uh, you know, intellectual capability. And I think this is likely to happen more and more in the armed forces without us doing very much for the simple reason that today the officer and sailor, uh, at least in the Navy, I'm sure it's for the other service, come from the study in the same schools uh, because... Uh, senior sailors and master warrant officers and all send their children, officers send their children to the same schools, they mm. study in the same environment, sit for the same examination. Some don't make it to the officer cadre, some make it to the sailors. So in the Navy, we have sailors and officers from very similar backgrounds. The sailor has a lot of incentive to keep working hard, study further, etc., pass exam. And many of them uh, uh, make it to the uh, academies. I've been to IMA and I was delighted to find there were seven uh, gentlemen cadets who were former sailors in the Indian Navy. I was delighted. I wasn't even aware of this. So I think this kind of thing is going to happen more and more in our armed forces because the social divide is, is, is disappearing and people will get promoted on their uh, abilities themselves. So I don't think we need to worry too much. Philip, any comments on yours? <clears throat> See the... Um... <clears throat> We definitely uh, would like a system where uh, all these Agnivirs are better educated and considering that technology requirements of our three services, we would come up with people who can step out of the military and do well outside. But unfortunately, this is linked to the education system in our country. Mm. And to um, sort of come out of that system, become an enlisted soldier and come out of it 
and uh, go back into civil uh, sort of uh, civil life and do well and be in the lead as far as any sort of technology or something it it can happen but it will be very very rare uh, it will be the exception than the rule so to that extent i think when we talk or imagine these sort of things happening we should be very sure that the larger system that we are talking about in our country in terms of education in terms of um, the uh, skill development in terms of the opportunities of employment which are available everywhere um, if, if we had everything happening well uh, then the possibility of what you are saying that people coming out of the army and and sort of giving back to society uh, in, in a positive sort of way uh, it would be uh, it would i mean the possibility will be that much more but i don't think so i think that uh, where we are it can happen but uh, it cannot be something which will happen normally it just cannot happen i think the larger system will have to grow will have to improve before we can uh, think of uh, you know the uh, what you are talking about but there is one point i'd like to make yeah that mm. one of the uh, incentives which can be held out uh, for uh, people who are joining because there is a talk somewhere from day one when the agnipath scheme was launched there was talk of the army navy air force getting a better quality of people more technology oriented people uh, people who are more uh, modern in their educational uh, sort of outlook but when you look at the actual recruitment as it's going to happen you find that uh, the level of recruits are going to be more or less the same mm. so where is it that this additional sort of technology based chap is going to come out from i, I really there is a mis mismatch somewhere but definitely there is a possibility that as an incentive for all these people who are joining the agnipath scheme as agni veers we could hold out within the military or uh, on their leaving the military give them some advantage in terms of uh, college education uh, that some that's a, a path we have not discussed or gone into much so far mm. i'm sure it will happen uh, over a period of time but i feel education uh, is also something that we can give to the agni veer who's stepping out so that sure. based on his uh, experience in the military making him more confident and disciplined and then he being uh, able to access a uh, better education and both things combined possibly he will do uh, better in life rather than be stuck to the mold of that uh, guard that we spoke about right in the beginning because if the agnivir is going to be seen as a a guy who's going to be mostly end up as guards in the corporate system then i suppose uh, we can't say this uh, this whole uh, scheme has been a success uh, matchi i just want to point out that john boyd's contribution to air warfare tactics and aircraft design were all made while he was still in the air force yes unfortunately he retired as a lieutenant colonel because he was a very brusk man and didn't know how to handle the seniors that's right that's right huma any uh, points from your side yeah you Yes, sir. Uh, I just um, I just wanted to ask two questions. One to Admiral Prakash, if he allows me to. I uh, he uh, in the beginning he said that you know we do need the young men, uh, young men, uh, as far as the navy is concerned. So, what kind of a role do you think they will be playing? Because they are saying the seventy five percent who goes back. they will be they can join the merchant navy as well so merchant navy job is not that cushy not that the indian navy job is going to be cushy for these people but what kind of a job are they going to do i mean considering they go on playing this line that everyone who's going to come in will mostly be tech savvy because they know how to operate the mobile phones that's been said in a press conference i'm not saying it on my own so i just want to understand this from you sir as well as from general uh, campus please okay uh, thanks kumar so uh, we'll start with admiral and this will also be uh, the concluding remarks you can also comment on how the how does the future look and i'll start with admiral go ahead sir uh thank you for that question uh, mr siddiqui i don't recall saying that the navy need young people we are already getting young people 
I just said that the Navy's average age is pretty good. It's 26, 27. So we have never asked for younger people. We are quite happy with the current system of recruitment. That's one. Um, secondly, um, people who join, as I think the general mentioned just now, people who join will still be the same. They will be selected on the basis of running one mile in under six minutes or passing some very basic written paper. So their level will be the same. No BTECs are going to join as Jawan, Taylor, or Rayman. So the intake will be the same. It is up to the service to give them inputs to make them tech savvy, etc. And that will not happen in four years. But if you enhance the engagement to six to seven years, yes, by the time they come out of the armed forces, their engagement, they will be tech savvy. And then, of course, then they can have entry into uh, various fields. Uh, currently, all the sailors who leave the Navy for after whatever uh, engagement, they join all streams. It's not that they just have to join the merchant Navy. They are in banking, they are in railways, they are in the police, but uh, very few of them. Many of them have to start businesses or go home and start farming again because the employment is not guaranteed. So the Navy is no different. A merchant Navy, again, there is no reservation. They are very strict about who they, who they take. They, they need qualifications, etc. So um, that is the state of affairs that we are at the moment Navy is quite happy with their age profile. Uh, we don't need any younger people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Philip? See, uh, I, I would say something similar as far as the army is concerned in that the people who are going to come to us, they're going to be no different. And uh, as far as the army is concerned, considering our very large numbers and our connection to various communities, uh, we are all aware about these one-class regiments and historically uh, how, uh, you know, uh, communities have uh, the peasant community uh, in various parts of the country. The peasant who alternates as the soldier is the same family who's got some people working in the fields and the other who are, who are serving in the, in the army. So when you look at this sort of uh, system, uh, I, I don't think... Uh, we, we are creating a special lot of people who are going to be equipped to be doing something better technologically or there are other sort of uh, fields of employment where they are going to get an advantage. I really don't think so. But like uh, the Admiral said, uh, if we link it to other things as to what happened, one is you increase the tenure of the Agnivir because four years actually you can do nothing. Four years, uh, if you try and spend more time on training uh, and empowering him further, uh, then he doesn't serve at all. Uh, by the time you finish with this empowerment process and the training process, it's time to go home uh, or, or wherever. So the, the, the period has to be increased because if the period is increased, then the soldier, sailor or airman gets empowered to a point where he can better serve the military as also be better empowered and equipped to uh, make a mark outside. But when you put four years and which brings a, you know, a, a limit on how much you can spend time on training him, then I don't think it's, it's going to work either way, either for uh, the Agnivir uh, or for the uh, system outside. Thank you, uh, General Philip. Uh, uh, Amar Shal Suresh. Yeah, comments. Uh, yes, uh, very quick. This thing, sir, like I uh, fully agree with uh, both the other panelists on the pool from which you are taking people is the same. Uh, if you are talking about the Air Force, now we are actually teaching them English also when they come in because most of the instructions, manuals, etc., are in English, technical manuals. So that is the stage from which we start. Now, from there, to bring them up to be able to fight a modern technology oriented warfare is a huge challenge. Here we are talking about multi-domain operations. You're talking about AI. You're talking about internet of military things. You're talking about blockchain, whatever you want to talk about. So if you want to bring them up to be up to speed, as far as all this is concerned, it need to invest in training. If you need to invest in training, it costs. You cannot let go so simply. Now, even if you want to talk about, I'm not, so four years, absolutely, it's a no-go as far as the Air Force is concerned. So what is it, seven years, 10 years? You need to decide. Somebody needs to go into the detail and decide. The people are letting go. You need to equip them because in the Sevi Street, like Admiral Prakash said, you know, tell me one uh, corporate which has taken how many people? And he asked Mr. Mahindra. So uh, 
you need degrees when you're talking about somebody who is actually uh, selecting people for jobs they look at various other things so degrees skill sets etc are an inherent part of the selection process otherwise like general campo said you'll talk about only security guard business so that is not fair you also need to equip them to adapt to the cv street so all the, it's it's not in isolation actually it's a whole actually rigmarole that you need to put them through but the last bottom line i would request again is a primary task is war fighting and enhancing war fighting capability operational capability combat capability Absolutely. and within a very short time because we have got a limited window it is still 20 49 but between now but maybe it's much earlier but we need to transform as a force technologically to take on this new dimensions of warfare while keeping this lessons from the russian ukraine conflict in mind that is a huge challenge we have no spare capacity for diversion thank you uh, and i Uh, uh, sir, sir, your comments, final comments. Uh, you are muted. You are unmuted. Sir. You want the concluding comment? Yes, yes. Yes, I have only one comment. Uh, there was an observation made on uh, the um, uh, post-release um, employment on the demobbed soldiers. That is not. Uh, uh that should not be the focus here that is what was observed but i have a comment on that uh, the reason being if we are keeping the entire scheme as a four year tenure is going to be a big headache for the government after four years both politically economically and socially because it's a huge number when we look at uh, the national uh, population uh, today Uh, we have registered unemployed about 1.43 crores registered unemployed out of which about um, 40% only get regular employment all others are still waiting for employment if you look at the employment exchange statistics there are people who are waiting for 10 years 12 years so here is a band of trained employed agnibis remaining unemployed after 4 years that going to be a big headache headache for the government that is where my submission is let us look at it rationally i gave you the figures earlier at the beginning it is actually vacancies reserved remaining unutilized is 3 lakh 33583 33583 they are meant for esm and remaining unfulfilled let us look at it rationally as i said what are the bottlenecks and what are we doing to remove the bottlenecks it is possible to do hand holding of these released esm and the agnivis prepare them for these reserved jobs if we can do that i think we can solve half the problem and that responsibility is with the government and the armed forces that is my point thank you thank you captain uh, huma any final comments from your side so i um, uh, i actually agree with what uh, captain seven uh, uh, just now said and you know like we really when when they all come out we really need to even think about it because after all the armed forces are to spend so much of time and money and uh, you know whatever technology training they're going to give them and they come out and they continue to be just you know um, unemployed who is responsible so some somewhere uh, i i don't know if the system can think about how they're going to help them or uh, how they are going to do the hand holding because again technology it takes savvy doesn't mean that they come out and they just stand in front of the you know any corporate house and start begging for jobs so somebody uh, the government uh, I mean, the system has to help them 
that's what I personally, I mean, I just agree with what, what has been just said. So that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Huma. And uh, we've uh, come to the end of the uh, time. In fact, we've overshot uh, the timing a little bit. But this has been an excellent and uh, extremely interesting panel. And we there is a lot of ground to cover. But I think uh, it's been uh, wonderful interacting with uh, the distinguished panelists, Admiral Arun Prakash, General Philip Campos, Air Marshal Suresh, Captain uh, Sir Asylum, IAS, and uh, Huma Siddiqui. Thank you so much for spending, uh, spending your time and being with us. I just want to close in the context of, uh, I think, uh, the most important point all uh, uh, the Admiral, uh, General and Air Marshal particularly have made is that combat capability and war fighting uh, uh, capability is extremely, it should be the primary and absolutely non-negotiable uh, issue that needs to be addressed. Notwithstanding that, the, the larger, these are people who are going to contribute to the their national strength and that is political leadership's responsibility on how to address that. And I just want to quote from, there was a lot of discussions on military service in the Constituent Assembly. And I, I just want to quote Ambedkar. And this is what he said, in a country like India, the government must be supported by its people and compulsory military service would be nothing but calling upon the citizens of this country to fulfill that duty and nothing else. The assembly agreed that the conscription is not prohibited by the fundamental rights as well. And fundamental duties, which is part of 4A of the constitution, had laid down a citizen's duty to defend the country and render national service when called upon to do so. Additionally, military service is a tool of state formation and building, but it is also a means from which a nation building and cohesion could be promoted, particularly in countries where significant pluralism exists and subnationalism exists. The military service is the foremost instrument to bring in national integrity. Thank you very much. And it's been wonderful interacting with you all. I'll just ask Sakshi to give the word of thanks. Sir. Sakshi. Yes, sir. Um, I think you summed up uh, the evening quite well, sir. Um, but on behalf of the Peninsula Foundation, um, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to Admiral Arun Prakash, Lieutenant General Philip Campos, Air Marshal B. Suresh, Captain R. Sivasailam, and Ms. Huma Siddiqui um, for joining us on this very important um, issue and sharing their expertise and views with us. I think this discussion has been extremely enlightening and offered all of us an insider's view into the ongoing debate on India's military reforms and the various factors that we need to keep in mind as we ponder this issue. I'd like to thank Air Marshal Matiswaran for bringing together this uh, eminent panel, taking this discussion forward and sharing his views on this subject. And so last but not the least, I'd like to thank our lovely audience for joining us today and look forward to seeing you all at PPF's future events. Uh, thank you and have a good night. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, uh, thank you. Have a thank nice you. day. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, sir. Matsi, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Welcome, welcome. That's true. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Sir Simon. All the best. And lots of seniors and uh, people are here. Thank you.